Good evening. Did you have a nice day today? Filled with God's blessings? Amen. You're scattered about like sheep without a shepherd. <laughs> Actually, your shepherd, I talked to Pastor Mora uh, in the language of heaven, of course, Spanish. <laughs> and he deeply regretted that he could not be here because he already had a trip planned with the conference and there's just no way it could be changed. So uh, if he's watching the live stream, Pastor Mora, I want to thank you for giving me the privilege of occupying the pulpit that you occupy on a regular basis here at the Kernersville Church. Just a couple of points I want to make before we review last night and uh, study some new material. Uh, first of all, I brought some cards. I don't know how many of you are on the Secrets Unsealed mailing list, but if you're not on our mailing list, I would recommend that you sign up to be on the mailing list. Um, we send out our newsletters. They're not small newsletters. Usually I write a 15, 20-page article on different issues. Uh, there's an article on health. There's an article for youth. There's special offers for materials totally free. I mean, uh, the, the, um, the newsletter is totally free. We also have notices about meetings and where they're going to take place, the calendar, and so on. So if you want to sign up these cards, I'll just put them here. Uh, you can come and get one after the service is finished. The second thing that I want to mention is, uh, you know, in the introduction it was said that I am um, I'm a retired uh, minister from denominational employment, and that's true. I retired about three years ago, but uh, I still work for the growth of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. I still carry a ministerial credential. I still am a faithful member of the church and I return my tithes and offerings to the Seventh-day Adventist Church. So I'm not disconnected from the Adventist Church. Um, I am president of a self-supporting ministry, which supporting ministries are a tremendous blessing because they really help bring people into the church at no expense to the regular conferences. So um, I just want to clarify that, uh, that uh, I still am very active. I'm working full-time. Uh, because I haven't found the word retirement in the Bible. And uh, furthermore, I have a saying, I would rather wear out than rust out. <laughs> All right. Let's have a word of prayer, and we'll review last night for those who were not able to be here, and then we will get into some new material. Father in heaven, we thank you so much for this wonderful day that we have enjoyed. Thank you for giving us life. Thank you for your many bounties and blessings which you pour out upon us without limit. We ask this evening that especially as we open your holy word, that you will help us to understand it, to apply it, and give us the power, Lord, to proclaim it. And we thank you for hearing our prayer. We ask it in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. All right, let's review for those of you who were here last night. By the way, who was not here last night? Raise your hand. Those who were not, where were you? <laughs> see, I, people usually ask how many were here. I asked who was not here because I wanted to see who wasn't here. But anyway, for uh, out of mercy for those who were not able to come last night, we will do a review. Everybody who came last night, is, uh, are you in favor of that, doing a review? Okay, good. We're going to do it quickly. The days of creation were millions of years long. False. The days of creation were what? Literal 24-hour days like the days that we know today. Second, the first week is whose week? Is the first week man's week? Why isn't it man's week? Because God was the one who worked six, and God was the one who ceased. Adam and Eve did not work, and they couldn't cease because they ceased from what? They hadn't worked. So the first week is not man's week. It's God's week, which then God gives to man after he makes the week. Number three, the word Shabbat means what? To cease. In other words, 
on the seventh day, the word Shabbat doesn't tell us how God rested the seventh day. It simply tells us that on the seventh day, God ceased from creating. He created no more. He quit creating. It tells us what God did not do on the seventh day. He did not create anything more. Okay, when did God make the Sabbath holy and bless it? When it started or when it ended? When it ended, that's right. In other words, God could not tell Adam and Eve when the, that first Sabbath was beginning, keep the Sabbath holy because the Sabbath did not become holy until it ended. Then God could tell Adam and Eve, now tomorrow you're going to start working six and the next Sabbath you're going to keep the Sabbath the way you saw me keep it. All right. Uh, next point. The seventh day had no evening and morning. Why? It doesn't say it was the evening and morning of the seventh day. Because, you know, people struggle a little bit with this. The simple reason is because God worked six days, He ceased on the seventh, and the next day He did not begin a new cycle. Are you understanding the point? He did not begin a new cycle of six days of work. Man did, but God didn't. Has God been ceasing since creation? Has God done another cycle of six and cease on the seventh? No. But did God tell man to work six and cease on the seventh? Yes. So it applies to man, does not apply to whom? Does not apply to God. Is this making sense? Now we know why it doesn't say it was the evening and morning of the seventh day, because the first Sabbath is God's Sabbath before it's ours. How many times did God finish His work? How many times? Twice? How can you finish something twice? When did He actually finish the portrait of the beautiful uh, work of art? The sixth day. But what was still missing? The signature that identifies who made it. And so the seventh day is God's signature on His work of creation. When we keep the Sabbath, what are we commemorating? I'll give you half credit for that. When we keep the Sabbath, what are we commemorating? We are commemorating God's rest. Are you with me? Yes, it's a, it, it, we keep it in honor of creation, yes. But we are actually keeping it as a memorial of God's rest. Must it be on Sabbath? Yes. Why? Because it's something that happened historically. It's rooted in history. And you cannot change a historical event. So you can't say, oh yeah, I commemorate creation on Sunday because God did not cease on Sunday. Is the Sabbath in Genesis the same Sabbath as the Sabbath in the fourth commandment? Yes. How do we know that? Because in Genesis it says that God rested, blessed and sanctified the Sabbath. In Exodus it says that God rested, He blessed and sanctified the Sabbath. It is the same Sabbath. So you're all caught up now in just a very brief period. Now this evening we want to take a look at some other issues relating to the Sabbath. You say, why are we studying this? Because very soon, I believe, we will be brought, according to the Spirit of Prophecy, also uh, Matthew chapter 24 and uh, Mark 13, we will be brought before rulers and influential people to give a reason for our faith. And they're going to bring out some of these arguments. They're going to say, well, the seventh day didn't have an evening and morning, so we can enter God's rest any day. Anybody ever heard of Dale Retzleff? Sends out a magazine called Proclamation. Two, his two main arguments against the Sabbath is, number one, God did not command Adam and Eve to keep that first Sabbath. Therefore, it is not a creation institution. And secondly, there wasn't an evening and morning to the seventh day. And for that reason, God's rest is open any day. Those are his two arguments in the book that he wrote against the Sabbath. Used to be a Seventh-day Adventist. But last night, we provided the answers to those two things, two objections that he brings up to the Sabbath. 
And by the way, he's not the only one. People who belong to the different Protestant churches, bless their hearts, many of them are even bit more faithful to the Lord than many Adventists because they live in harmony with the light that they have, but they just, you know, they don't have the total light. And it's our responsibility to study these things, learn them, learn how to present them, and then go out and reach out to others, folks. We can't just sit and warm the pew. We can't enjoy just the benefits of salvation and not fulfill our responsibilities as church members as well. Now let's go to Exodus 31, 16 and 17. Exodus 31, 16 and 17. These are verses that are used by people who say that we no longer have to keep the Sabbath. And I'm going to tell you how, you, how, how they use these particular verses. It says in Exodus 31, verse 16, Therefore, the children of Israel shall keep the Sabbath, to observe the Sabbath throughout their generations as a perpetual covenant. So who is supposed to keep the Sabbath according to verse 16? The children of Israel are supposed to keep the Sabbath. Then verse 17 says, It is a sign between me and the children of Israel forever. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, and on the seventh day he rested and was refreshed. So the argument is very clearly Exodus 31, 16 and 17 says that the children of Israel shall keep the Sabbath and that it is a sign between God and Israel. So it's not for the church, it's for the Jews. That's the argument. The problem with that argument is that the reason why God said in Exodus that the Sabbath was a sign between him and Israel is because Israel was his people at that time. God wasn't going to say it's a sign between me and the church. The church didn't exist. So God is simply making a statement of fact. He's saying my people are Israel and the Sabbath at this point is a sign between me and Israel. Are you following me or not? So it doesn't say that it's exclusively for Israel. God is simply saying that it is a sign between him and, him and his people at that particular point in time. Now, we also need to define who Israel is. You know, uh, Christians today make a big, strong distinction. They dichotomize the church in Israel. No, God has one plan for literal Israel, for the Jews. He has another plan for the Christian church. That's why they teach that God is going to take the church to heaven in the rapture and is going to leave the Jews behind. Because God has two radically separable people, the people of the old covenant and the people of the new covenant. The problem with that point of view is that the New Testament defines who Israel is. Let's go to the book of Galatians. Galatians chapter 3, Galatians chapter 3, and let's see who a Jew is. Galatians chapter 3, and let's read beginning with verse 26, 3, 26. It says there, For you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. So in other words, those who have been baptized, uh, you know, they've, they've united with Christ. Verse 28, Therefore there is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free, there is neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And now notice, And if you are Christ's, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. So according to the New Testament, who is an Israelite? Who is uh, the seed of Abraham? The seed of Abraham is whoever has accepted Jesus Christ. So is the Sabbath for Israel? Yes, but Israel is divided in two stages, Old Testament Israel and New Testament Israel. And the Sabbath doesn't change for either Israel. Let me go to one other text, which is very significant. 
Revelation chapter 12, and we can't dwell long on this, uh, but I'm just going to make a couple of remarks. Revelation chapter 12, verses 1 through 5, I'm not going to read the verses, I want you just to catch the picture. Verses 1 through 5, you have a woman. What does a woman represent? The church. Is it the Old Testament church or is it the New Testament church? <laughs> you see, I suspend judgment until I hear what the pastor has to say. When John sees the woman in Revelation 12 verse 1, it's the Old Testament church. And you say, why is that? For a very simple reason. Because she has a child in her womb and the child has not been born yet. Are you with me? Can there be a New Testament church before Jesus was born? <laughs> of course not. So the woman represents God's Old Testament people that are crying out in anguish for the Messiah to come. And then it says that the dragon, Satan, is there waiting for the child to be born. Are you following the picture? But he's not able to destroy the child. The child is caught up to God and to his throne. So let me ask you, was Jesus born from the lineage of Old Testament Israel? Of course he was. You have three genealogies. You have the genealogy in Genesis chapter 5. You have a genealogy in, in Genesis chapter 11. And you have a genealogy in Matthew chapter 1 that traces the, the descendants or the ascendants of Jesus from uh, the very first individuals who inhabited this earth from Seth all the way till Joseph and Mary when Jesus was born. In other words, you have the total genealogy of Jesus. From, crea from creation all the way to the times of Christ. So the woman, first of all, represents the Old Testament Israel that is longing for the Messiah to come. But then notice something very interesting. It says that after the child escapes from the dragon, he's caught up to God into his throne, which is the ascension of Christ. It says that the woman fled to the wilderness where she was persecuted for 1260 years. Would that be the New Testament church? That would be the New Testament church. So how many churches does God have? One. Represented by one woman. The woman from whom Christ is born and the woman who later flees to the wilderness. There is no dichotomy between Old Testament Israel and New Testament Israel. New Testament Israel does not replace Old Testament Israel. New Testament Israel continues the legacy of ancient Israel. And so the Sabbath that God gave to them is the Sabbath that he gives to us because we are Israel, spiritually speaking. Are you with me? Now, I frequently ask people from other denominations three questions. We're still dwelling on this particular point. I say, first of all, let me ask you this. To whom does the light belong? Oh, it belongs to God. To whom does the firmament belong? It belongs to God. To whom does the vegetation belong? The answer, belongs to God. To whom do the sun, moon, and stars belong? Of course, they're gods, they say. To whom do the birds and the fish belong? They say, oh, to God. To whom do the land animals belong? To God. To whom do men and women belong? to God. So I say to them, good answer. Now let me ask you another question. Why do they belong to God? Why do these things belong to God? And they have an immediate answer. Well, because God made them. They're His because He made them. And then, of course, some will quote, for example, Psalm 24, 1 and 2, where it says, the earth is the Lord's, in all its fullness, the world and those who dwell therein, for, that means because, because he has founded it upon the seas and established it upon the waters. 
But then I, I ask them, I say, okay, so you're saying that the light belongs to God, the firmament belongs to God, the vegetation is God's, the sun, moon, and stars are God's, and you're saying that the birds and fish are God's, and that the land animals are God's, and that the human beings are God's, but you're saying that the Sabbath belongs to the Jews. Did God make the Sabbath at the same time he made everything else? So to whom does the Sabbath belong? You can't say that everything God made during creation week belongs to God, but the Sabbath belongs to the Jews. Because the Sabbath was made at the same time. Are you following me? This is the reason why, listen, not once in all of the Bible do you ever find the expression, the Sabbath of the Jews. Never. The Bible uses four ways of referring to the Sabbath. It is called in Exodus 20, 11, the Sabbath of the Lord your God. In Ezekiel 20, verse 12, God says, you will keep my Sabbaths. In Isaiah 58, 13 and 14, God says, take away your foot from trampling on my holy day. And Jesus said in Mark 2, 27, that he is the Lord of the Sabbath because he made the Sabbath it says there so the Sabbath does not belong to the Jews the Sabbath is God's Sabbath always in the Bible now let me share an interesting tidbit with you even though the expression Sabbath of the Jews never appears in the Bible when you have reference to one of the Hebrew feasts for example the Passover and the Feast of Tabernacles you find in the Gospel of John that John refers to the festivals as festivals of the Jews. So when it comes to the ceremonial Sabbath, John says Sabbaths of the Jews or feasts of the Jews. But never does he call the Sabbath the Sabbath of the Jews. Let me give you some examples. John 2 verse 13 says it was the Passover of the Jews. John 5 verse 1 says it was a feast of the Jews. John 6 verse 4 says it was the Passover, a feast of the Jews. John 7 verse 2 says it was the Jews feast of tabernacles. John 11 55 it says the Jews Passover was nigh at hand. So when, it's, when it deals with the ceremonial festivals they are of the Jews because they ended when Jesus fulfilled them, but never the Sabbath. By the way, did you know that Jesus is only the Messiah of the Jews? That's what the Bible says. When the wise men came to Jerusalem, they said, where is the king of the Jews? <laughs> so, just, so, so because it says he's king of the Jews, he's not king of Christians. That make any sense? Of course not. Now let me read you a statement by Henry Morris. It's in the book Biblical Creationism, page 253. You know, he's one of the individuals who believes that God established the Sabbath at creation for all human beings. But then he kind of spoils it because he says, but, but you know, we don't know that the Sabbath today is the same Sabbath of creation. So any day will do. But notice there's a statement that he wrote. With the passing of the centuries, the Sabbath eventually became almost exclusively associated with the religious ceremonies of the nation of Israel. Even though the Creator had hallowed it originally for all men. When the Creator eventually became man, however, in the person of Jesus Christ, he stressed that it had never been intended as a mere Jewish religious festival as the Pharisees had distorted it, but for the good of all men. And uh, Henry Morris was not any, uh, any lightweight. He had an institution of creation science down in San Diego, worldly renowned as a creationist organization. And he writes here that the Sabbath, twice he says in this statement, that the Sabbath was made for all human beings. Now let's notice another thing 
We just finished dealing with Exodus 31, 16, and 17. Does that help? Okay, now, let's deal with Easter, or what Hispanics call Semana Santa. I guess we also call it Holy Week, don't we? Does the Bible say it's, uh, does the Bible any place say it's Holy Week? No, but uh, people these days, Christians call Easter, Easter week, they call it Holy Week. And you know, they'll refer, for example, to um, Palm Sunday, Ash Wednesday, Holy Thursday, Holy Friday, Resurrection Sunday. Is there anywhere in the Bible that says we're supposed to commemorate all these things? The celebration of Easter is a mere human tradition. Nowhere are we told to celebrate Palm Sunday or Ash Wednesday or Holy Thursday. Now let me ask you, how many times a year do Christians celebrate Palm, Palm Sunday? Once a year. How many times a year do they celebrate, for example, Ash Wednesday? Once a year. How often do they celebrate Holy Thursday and Holy Friday? Once a year. So why do they celebrate Resurrection Sunday every week? Are you with me? It's simply a human tradition. Nowhere does the Bible say we're supposed to celebrate Sunday as a commemoration of the resurrection every week. Now, let me read you from Ellen White. In Great Controversy 290, she wrote, Rome, she's speaking about the papacy, Rome began by enjoining what God had not forbidden. And she ended by forbidding what he had explicitly enjoined. And you can see that by all kinds of traditions that are still celebrated in the Christian world today. Now some people say, but Pastor Bohr, how could the Sabbath be lost so quickly? Do you know that we have evidence that already at the end of the first century there were individuals who were, were observing Sunday in honor of the resurrection? And within the second century, the Sabbath disappeared even more until finally by the times of Constantine, Sunday had replaced the Sabbath. They say, how could the Sabbath be replaced so quickly in less than a hundred years? Well, let me ask you this. How could the musical styles of the church have changed just in the last 50 years? How is it possible that even within liberal Christian churches, they say that there are more than two genders in less than 40 years? How is it that some churches, like the United Presbyterian Church, puts a rainbow in front of their church, saying that it's okay for a man to marry a man and a woman to marry a woman in just a few years? How is it possible that some churches have embraced the evolutionary theory just in the last 40 or 50 years. You see, apostasy can come into the church very quickly. It doesn't take centuries. It can, be, it can happen in a very short period of time. Now some people say, but Pastor Bohr, how do you know that the Sabbath today is the same Sabbath of creation? How do you know that the, that the Sabbath hasn't changed? How do you know the Sabbath that we keep today is the same Sabbath that Jesus observed? Hasn't the day been lost? Well, I usually ask three questions. It's good to ask questions. First question, which day of the week do you keep as holy? The answer will be Sunday talking to a non adventist Sunday. I say, okay, let me ask you a second question. Why do you keep Sunday? They say, well, that's because Jesus resurrected on Sunday. So I say, what you're telling me is that you keep Sunday today because it's the same Sunday that Jesus resurrected, right? Yes. Well, if Sunday is the same Sunday Jesus resurrected, the Sabbath must be the same Sabbath. 
Are you with me? But then they ask and say, how do you know that the Sabbath that Jesus kept is the same Sabbath of creation? And the answer is very simple. Jesus created the Sabbath and he would not have kept the wrong day because he created it. You see, these are all excuses that are given to not keep the Sabbath. And I can never understand the reason why Christians do not want to keep the Sabbath. Take one whole day to suspend everything ours to focus on everything His. It's a blessing. You know, I work more on Sabbath than any other day as a pastor, but it's a change of pace. It's wonderful to be in the church with the brothers and the sisters, to have a worship service, to hear a sermon, to go out and minister to the sick and the needy in the afternoon, to give Bible studies, just to do everything spiritual on the Sabbath and not do anything that I regularly do. Cease as God ceased from our regular endeavors. If we love Jesus, won't we want to spend that time with Him? All 24 hours? Absolutely. Now, you know, some calendars begin the week on Monday. In Europe, we have the, the, the brother uh, who um, spoke in Spanish tonight. He, um, he comes from Colombia. And if you go, for example, to the website of Avianca, which is the main Colombian airline, you'll find that the calendar begins on Monday. Monday is the first day of the week, not Sunday. So if you begin the week on Monday as the first day of the week, what would the seventh day be? Sunday would be the seventh day. It's a sneaky way of Satan trying to convince people that Sunday is the, the day, the seventh day that the Bible mentions that we're supposed to keep. However, the Bible makes it very clear that Jesus did not resurrect on the seventh day of the week. Jesus resurrected on the first day of the week. So you can prove from the Bible that the calendars are wrong. And by the way, in Colombia, there's a program that's called The Seventh Day, and it's broadcast on Sunday. <laughs> so it's just a sneaky way. And in Europe, you have many countries that begin, you know, you look at websites and so on, they begin the week on a Monday, so that the seventh day is Sunday but it doesn't square with the Bible. Let's notice Luke 23, verse 54 through chapter 24 and verse 1 to see if the Bible has a sequence of days very clear. Luke 23, verse 54 through chapter 24 and verse 1. Speaking about Friday, it says, That day was the preparation, and the Sabbath drew near. So which day uh, did Jesus die? Friday, because it says the Sabbath drew near. In other words, the Sabbath was about to begin. And the women who had come with him from Galilee followed after, and they observed the tomb and how his body was laid. Then they returned and prepared spices and fragrant oils, and they rested on the Sabbath according to the commandment. Which day would that be? The seventh day. Now what day did Jesus resurrect? Verse, verse 24. And it says, now, or chapter 24 and verse 1, now on the first day of the week, very early in the morning, they and certain other women with them came to the tomb bringing the spices that they had prepared, but they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. What day did Jesus resurrect? The first day of the week. So much for the idea that Sunday is the seventh day. Now some people say, but Pastor Bohr, all days really are holy. Now let's, uh, let's take a look at this. Are you acquainted with the Hebrew festivals? What were the three, three first Hebrew festivals of the Jewish religious year? It was first of all the Passover, then what? The next day was unleavened bread, and the following day was first fruits. What did the Passover represent? Christ what? Christ's death. What did the unleavened bread represent? His burial. What did first fruits represent? His resurrection. Now, how many times a year were the Jewish festivals celebrated? 
How many times a year? Once a year, right? They were yearly festivals. So here's the question. If the Hebrew festivals were yearly festivals, and uh, you know, Christians these days, they celebrate the death of Christ, the Passover, once a year, and the burial of Christ once a year, and so on. Why do they celebrate the resurrection every week if first fruits, which represented the resurrection of Jesus, was celebrated by the Jews yearly? Are you following what I'm saying? First fruits, which represents the resurrection of Christ, was celebrated among the Jews how frequently? Every year. So why do Christians today celebrate first fruits every week? Because it's a human tradition that is based simply on human speculation. It has no foundation or basis in the Bible. Now Pope John Paul II and Francis I have claimed that Sunday is the day of the new creation, a day to celebrate the new creation. Yet nowhere does the Bible teach such, a, such an idea. The Bible clearly teaches, as we're going to notice next, that the Sabbath is the sign of creation, of redemption, and of the final restoration when God makes a new heavens and a new earth. By the way, do you know what the sign of a new creation is today? It's baptism. Notice Romans 6 and verse 4. Romans chapter 6 and verse 4. Therefore we were buried with him through baptism into death. And then also verse 3 says that we were buried with him. And then it says that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. What is it that commemorates the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ? Sunday? No. What? Baptism commemorates it. Not Sunday. Very clearly. It says, buried with him through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. So the sign of a new creation is not Sunday. The sign of being a new creation is baptism. Now, When a person is baptized, at that moment they are in Christ, right? Uh, we read Galatians chapter 3 and verse 26, where it says those who have been baptized have put on Christ. As we, we become in Christ, we are in Christ at baptism. We get rid of the old Adam according to Romans chapter 5, and Romans chapter 6 says that we're born into the family of the, of the new Adam, of the second Adam. We are in Christ. Now notice 2 Corinthians 5.17. Those who are in Christ, the Bible has something very interesting to say. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, when do we become in Christ? At baptism. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. So what is the sign of the new creation? Sunday? No. What is? Baptism. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. No reference to Sunday being the commemorative uh, rite or ceremony. The Bible makes it very clear that baptism is a ceremony. And let me explain the reason why. You know, baptism is a lot deeper than what we usually think. I, I assume you have a baptistry behind here, right? Right, uh, right in front of that uh, beautiful glass stained window. Uh, when the pastor is in the baptistry, the candidate is in front of the pastor. The pastor pronounces the baptismal formula. I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. What's the last, last thing that the person does who is going to be put under the water? Stops breathing. They better. <laughs> 
What do they do while they're under the water? They don't breathe. What's the first thing that they do when they come forth from the water? They breathe again. You know what's happening in miniature? You're repeating the experience of Christ symbolically because he quit breathing on the cross. He was buried in the tomb and he breathed again on resurrection morning. That's why when we're baptized, we're incorporated into his experience. It's a symbolic way of saying that now we are in him. Because we died, we were buried and resurrected symbolically in the waters of baptism. We participate in his experience. Baptism is the sign of the new creation. It's not Sunday like John Paul II and um, Francis I have said. In fact, the Sabbath has three dimensions. It points to creation, it points to redemption, and it points to the creation of new heavens and new earth. Let me just pursue that for a few moments. The Bible tells us that Jesus finished his work of creation because he was the active agent in creation. He finished his work when? On the sixth day. Is that what Genesis says? It says, it uses the word finished. He finished his work on the sixth day. Genesis 1 and verse 31. What did he do on the seventh day? He rested or ceased from his work of creation. Right? What day of the week did Jesus die? On the sixth day, did Jesus finish his work of redemption when he died on the cross? What did he say on the cross? It is finished. And by the way, there's this discussion in the Adventist church of whether the atonement was finished on the cross or not. The provision for salvation was finished on the cross. But the application to individuals who claim it is applied to them as a result of the ministry of Jesus in the heavenly sanctuary. So the provision was complete. He wove a perfect robe of righteousness by his obedience and he paid the debt, of, debt for sin. But he goes to heaven now to intercede to apply those benefits to everyone who comes to him in faith and claims those benefits as their own. So there's one way in which the atonement was finished as a provision but not as an application because the benefits have to be applied to individuals. So Jesus, the sixth day, dies before he dies, he says, it is finished. And then what happened on Sabbath? He rested all day Sabbath in the tomb. Like he finished at creation and rested all day Sabbath after creation. Are you following me? Now there's a very interesting ceremony that I'm going to speak about in a moment. But let me read you this statement from Ellen White. See, it's... Some people were wondering, who is Ellen White, if you're a visitor? Well, I'll just be explicit. Ellen White, we believe, was called by God to be a prophet. She wrote many, many books. Many have been published. We do not believe that she's another Bible. We don't believe that she supersedes the Bible. We don't base any of our beliefs on the writings of Ellen White. We believe that she amplifies clarifies, corrects when we go astray from Bible truth. In other words, she does not supplement the Bible, she complements the Bible. We need to make that clear. But I stand amazed that this woman who had only two and a half years of primary education got so many things right, like we were noticing in some details in the talk last night. Like she knew that God did not command Adam and Eve to keep that first Sabbath. And yet that's the belief of most evangelists that preach today, the Adventist church. They say, well, you know, that first Sabbath, God commanded Adam and Eve to keep that first Sabbath. Ellen White said, no, no, no. That first Sabbath was the Lord's rest. And when he had rested all day, now he blesses it and sanctifies it. And then he gives the week to man and tells man, next Sabbath, in a continual cycle, keep the Sabbath as you saw me observe the Sabbath. She understood that, among many other things. 
with no theological education. So this is her comment in an article titled, The Man of Sorrows. It was, God, it was in God's plan that the work which Christ had engaged to do should be completed on a Friday. What is a synonym of completed? Finished. And that on the Sabbath he should rest in the tomb, even as the Father and the Son had rested after completing their creative work. Fantastic parallel. Now there's an interesting story in the Bible that I want to just dwell on for a few moments. The story of the manna in Exodus 16. I have an entire one hour presentation on this particular point I'm going to mention now, but I'll just give you the highlight. Because Christians say, well, if Sunday isn't important, why did Jesus resurrect on Sunday then? It must have been the important day, because Jesus chose to resurrect that day. But I'm going to show you that it's just the opposite by referring to the manna episode. The manna episode is in Exodus 16. When I was growing up, my parents always used that story, correctly by the way, to say God teaches us through the manna episode that we are supposed to keep the Sabbath. And so yeah, it's a good reason. But it was not a complete reason. Because they told me that I was supposed to keep the Sabbath, but they didn't tell me why. It wasn't until a few years ago I was studying once again the manna episode, and I discovered something very interesting. The why we're supposed to keep the Sabbath by following the counsel of God in the manna episode. Let me just put it this way. What does the manna represent? The manna represents Christ. Didn't Jesus say, I am the living manna who came down from heaven? So the manna spiritually represents whom? It represents Christ. But something specific about Christ, not just generally Christ, there's something specifically about Christ that the manna represents. You say, now what does it specifically represent? John 6 and verse 51 has the answer. I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread, which is the manna, and the bread that I shall give is what? My flesh, which I shall give for the life of the world. What does the manna specifically represent? The flesh of Christ. He said it himself. Now what happened uh, if Israel picked up manna on Wednesday and saved it for Thursday? Two things happened. It bred worms and it stank. Let me ask you, what is it that breeds worms and stinks? A decomposing body. Right? Now what happened when the Israelites picked up a double portion on Friday and saved it for the Sabbath? It was just as fresh on the Sabbath as it had been on Friday. Jesus died on Friday. What would have happened with the normal body, with the flesh of a normal body of an individual who died on a Friday? His body would begin to what? To decompose and to eventually breed worms and stink. But on Sabbath, the flesh of Jesus was just as fresh as it had been on Friday when he was placed in the tomb. Are you with me? So in other words, the manna episode tells us we're supposed to keep the Sabbath because that was the day that Jesus, the manna, rested in the tomb and his flesh saw no corruption. Keep the Sabbath to honor the Redeemer. You say, really? Go with me to Acts chapter 2. You know, Peter referred to the manna episode in the book of Acts, his sermon on the day of Pentecost. Acts chapter 2, and let's read verse 
25 through verse 27, and then we'll read verse 31. Acts chapter 2, verse 25 to 27. Here he's going to refer to a passage from Psalm 16, written by David, about the Messiah, a thousand years before Jesus was born. It says, For David says concerning him, that is concerning Christ, I foresaw the Lord always before my face, for he is at my right hand that I may not be shaken. Therefore my heart rejoiced and my tongue was glad. Moreover, my flesh also will rest in hope. This is Jesus speaking about his experience in the tomb a thousand years before it happened. What is he saying? My what? My flesh will what? Rest in hope. Why was the flesh of Jesus going to rest in hope? Verse 27. For you, he's speaking to God the Father, for you will not leave my soul in Hades. I like the NIV translation better. It says, you will not leave me in the grave. Nor will you allow your Holy One to see corruption. Why could the flesh of Jesus rest in hope? Because his flesh was not going to see what? Corruption. Just like the manna on the Sabbath saw no corruption. And then verse 31 tells us what Peter was talking about. He, that is David, foreseeing this, spoke concerning the resurrection of the Christ, that his soul, that is him, was not left in Hades, which is the grave, nor did his flesh see what? Nor did his flesh see corruption. So what does the manna episode teach us about why we're supposed to cease on the Sabbath? Because Jesus ceased his work of redemption on the Sabbath and his body saw no, no corruption. In other words, we keep the Sabbath to remember redemption besides creation. But there's another dimension, a future dimension of the Sabbath. What is the third dimension of the Sabbath? Before we, we, I mention a couple of verses, this world is going to return to the condition it was in before creation as a result of the plagues and the second coming. Let me ask you, is there going to be any light on this earth during the millennium? Jeremiah says, I beheld the earth and it was without form and void and the heavens had no light. Jeremiah 4.23. So, what God made the first day, the planet is in darkness, without form and void. Same expressions as in Genesis. Is the atmosphere going to be, or the firmament going to be defiled by all of the dead bodies on the earth? Yes. Is all of the vegetation going to die? The fourth plague burned it up. The sun, moon, and stars are going to be moved out of their places. Early writings, page 41. God doesn't have to create a new moon and a new, and a new sun when he makes a new heavens and new earth. All he has is to, uh, to do is recoup them from where they were sent when he spoke. Are all the fish going to die? Revelation 16, 3 says yes. Are all the birds going to be gone? Jeremiah says yes. Are all the land animals going to die? Yes, are all human beings going to die? So what has happened? This is decreation. The earth will return to primeval chaos and disorder. So let me ask you, you think God is going to have to make a new heavens and a new earth? Is he going to stop ceasing? <laughs> yeah, he's going to stop ceasing. He, has, he hasn't stopped ceasing yet. He hasn't begun a new cycle yet. But he's going to begin a new cycle when he makes a new heavens and a new earth. By the way, when he makes a new heavens and a new earth, do you know what he's going to say? He's going to say, it is finished. Notice Revelation chapter 21, verses 4 through 7. Revelation 21, verses 4 through 7. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. There shall be no more pain. For the former things have passed away. Then he who sat on the throne said, Behold, I make all things what? New. And he said to me, Write, 
for these words are true and faithful. And he said to me, it is done. What is the synonym of done? Finished. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give the fountain of the water of life freely to him who thirsts. So what is God going to say when he ends his work of recreation? He's going to say, it is finished. Did he say it is finished at creation? Yes. Did he say it is finished at redemption? Is he going to say it is finished at the end? Yes. By the way, how many days do you think God is going to take to make the new heavens and the new earth? <laughs> Seven. You say, how do you know that? Let's go to Isaiah 66. Isaiah 66, 22 and 23 verses that we know super well. We always use them in Bible studies. We use them in evangelism. Isaiah 66, 22 says, For as the new heavens and the new earth, which I will make shall remain before me, says the Lord, so shall your descendants and your name remain. And it shall come to pass that from one new moon to another, you know, some people say, "Ah, oh, you see, we're going to have to celebrate the new moon. That's part of the ceremonial law when we get to heaven. Listen, the new moon is also translated month in Scripture because the new moon marks the beginning of the month. That's the reason why the Spanish version says, de mes en mes. The Spanish version says from month to month. By the way, why are we going to go every month? Because Revelation chapter 22, verse 2 says that there's a tree that produces its fruit every month. You are aware that the tree of life is a battery charger, right? <laughs> Adam and Eve had to continue eating from the tree of life. I believe on a monthly basis because Revelation says we're going to eat every month to refurbish the battery. In other words, we're not going to be innately immortal in ourselves. Our life will still be dependent on God outside of us. And so it says, it shall come to pass that from one new moon to another, or from one month to another, and from one Sabbath to another, all the Jews shall come to worship before me. <laughs> no. All flesh, it says in Hebrew, shall come to worship before me. Do you know what John Paul II wrote in his pastoral letter, Dies Domini? He says that when everything comes to an end, we will observe an eternal Sunday. Inexcusable and totally anti-biblical. Because the Bible says that we will go from Sabbath to Sabbath to commemorate the new creation because immediately before it says the heavens and the new, the new heavens and new earth that I will create. And then it speaks about the Sabbath. You say, now how do you know that creation is going to take place in six days? It's, it's actually not rocket science. If we're going to keep the seventh day, there must be six before it. <laughs> Are you with me? But there's going to be a difference at the end of time. You see, at the beginning, Adam and Eve did not see God create anything. They had to believe God's story by faith. First day when God made the light, they weren't there. The firmament, they weren't there. The vegetation, they weren't there. Sun, moon, and stars placed in the heavens, they weren't there. The birds and the fish, they weren't there. The land animals, Adam was not there. Adam did not see his own creation. And when God created Eve, he put Adam to sleep. So Adam did not see the creation of Eve. So when God said, I'm the creator, they had to accept it by faith. But at the end of time, God's people are going to be spectators because we will be alive. We are going to have seats not in the bleachers. We're going to have box seats. Imagine there. God says, let there be light. Let there be the firmament, the fresh air, the atmosphere. Let the earth produce trees and flowers and green grass. And right before our eyes, wow! Then God says, let the sun, moon, and stars occupy the places where they're supposed to be. 
Let the, the, the heavens be filled with birds and the waters with fish. Let the land produce all kinds of land animals. And then God will say to his people who are observing, what do you think? And God's people will say, wow, what a great God you are. And God is going to say, what do you think about us maybe just spending this whole seventh day enjoying what I made? Are you catching the picture? So the Sabbath is a sign of creation. It's a sign of redemption. It is a sign of a new creation. Sunday fits nowhere within this scenario. It is a human invention. It is a human tradition not based on scripture. Some people say, but Pastor Bohr, all days belong to God. I believe that all days are God's. And I say, I agree. All days are God's because God created all days. Are you with me? Yeah, all days are God's, right. But not all days are holy. Let me ask you, how much of our money is God's? I'm going to make you raise your hand. How many of you believe that all our money belongs to God? Could we please have the deacons come forward? <laughs> We'd make a killing. <laughs> you just said that all your money belongs to God. But is all your money holy? How much of your money is holy? The tithe. All days are God's, but one is holy. So don't use the argument and say, well, you know, all days are God's, so any day I keep is fine. No, because all days are God's, but not all days are holy. He has separated one as holy. You know, we have two interesting stories in the Bible. For those who say, it doesn't make any difference what day you offer God as long as you offer one. Remember the story of Nadab and Abihu? The Bible says that they took common fire. God had said, when you bring fire to burn incense in the sanctuary, make sure that you bring the holy fire that I rained on the altar of sacrifice. That's holy fire. Don't bring any other kind of fire. Not the fire you cook with. Holy fire. But Nadab and Abihu, drunk with wine. Is the Christian world going to be drunk with wine at the end of time that does not allow them to distinguish between the holy and the common? Hmm. They took common fire and they took it in the sanctuary and presented it as if it was holy. And God said, ah, who cares? Fire is fire. No. The Bible says that fire came from the presence of the Lord and consumed the two boys. Because they offered the common as if it was holy. We have another story in the Bible, the story of Belshazzar. He took the holy vessels and he treated them as if they were common. What did God do? Did God said, ah, I don't care. No! That very night, Belshazzar perished. Because he used that, word. read Daniel 5, because he used the holy vessels in a common way. How do you think the Lord feels about Christians who take a holy day and treat it as if it's common? And take a common day and present it to God as if it's holy? If God accepts that, he's going to have to apologize to Belshazzar and Nadab and Abihu. When God says the Sabbath, he means the Sabbath. Now there's amazing things happening in the world today as we bring this to a close. Pope Francis I has written an, a very interesting encyclical. Uh, it's called Laudato Si, on the care for the environment. 
And basically, in that uh, encyclical, he argues that we need to care for creation. The main purpose is to say that we're experiencing climate change, that we need to take care of the environment. Now, I don't have any doubts that uh, climate has become a lot rougher. No doubt about it. But it's not because of fossil fuels. It's not because of the air conditioners we use. It's not because of uh, cow dung. Ellen White says that all kinds of explanations are offered except the real explanation, which is the fact that God is withdrawing His Holy Spirit from the earth. And of course, the capstone where God is going to end, finally remove the Spirit is because Sunday will be enforced on pain of not being able to buy or sell or of life itself. And that is the ultimate agenda behind this whole discussion on climate change. Now, Greta Thunberg, I don't know if we know who she is, the little girl from Europe. She, I think it was just yesterday that she went and she uh, gave a speech before the, the congressional leaders. And, you know, she, she emphasized that we need to not do what she says, we need to simply accept the science. Well, science also says that we came into existence from monkeys. Science today, the great majority of scientists, there's some creationist ones, but the majority of scientists say evolution is a proven fact. So why should we believe them any more about climate change than what we believe them about the theory of evolution? Now, don't get me wrong, Adventists should be the people who care most for the environment and are more careful about preserving the environment. Isn't that right? Because we believe that God created everything. We're supposed to care for creation. But the sign of care for creation is the Sabbath. And the Pope has emphasized, Francis I has emphasized three main things in all of his speeches. Number one, the family is ter terribly stressed out because they work, the kids go to school, they come home, mom has to cook dinner, they don't have any time to spend together. So the family needs one day a week to spend together. I bet you can't guess what day that is. Sunday. The second point, he says, we abuse the environment. We're abusing it seven days a week. The environment needs at least one day a week to rest. I bet you can't guess what day that is. Sunday. And then he also says, you know, the capitalist overlords, by the way, the Pope is a socialist, bordering on communist. I'm writing a newsletter article now, uh, the next one that's going to come out, proving this point. Do you know where the leader of the Jesuit order is from? From Venezuela. You know, do you know what's happening in Venezuela? Do you know how much the Pope has said about Venezuela? Nothing. Because he's a socialist. He's a, he agrees with what's, with what's going on there. And you're going to have the whole story. See, the Jesuit order has had a tremendous transformation since the period when in Central America, the Contras, Ron, the time of Ronald Reagan, when it looked like communism was going to take over Central America. The Jesuits were, were the individuals who actually spearheaded what is known as liberation theology. And of course this pope is a Jesuit. You know, previous popes, they spoke against abortion, against gay marriage, against euthanasia. This pope says nothing about that. He only speaks to the issues that the politicians want to hear. Because before winning over Protestants, he has to win over the kings of the world. See, we usually think, oh, the big sign is Catholics uniting with Protestants. No, no, the big sign 
is the papacy earning over the civil powers that the papacy was able to use during its period of dominion. That's the real sign. And, and the reason he's talking, using the talking points that the UN loves and that the nations of the earth love, the leaders, political leaders of the world love, except Donald Trump, who is exactly opposite, you know, Donald Trump. I, if there was hope for Nebuchadnezzar, there's hope for Donald Trump. <laughs> That's why I say to people, pray. You know, we're supposed to pray for our political leaders, no matter how, how nasty they are. But I believe that God has allowed him to be there to give us a little more time to do what we're supposed to do, which is tell people out there how things are going to wind down. People don't have the foggiest idea out there where things are leading to. They're stressed out. Their hearts are failing them for fear. They're looking to the Middle East. They say, oh, look, Iran. And, and you know, they, they, they say, signs that the rapture is soon to come. And meanwhile, the powers that are going to play the main role in end time events grow in Rome and the United States, and no one sees it because they're looking in the wrong place. So we need to let people know. Ellen White stated, I would want the book Great Controversy to go out more than any other book that I've written. Great Controversy, that's the book that needs to go out, she says. It's like reading the newspaper, particularly the last half of the book. We're seeing it fulfilled before our very eyes. And yet, you know, we come to church and we just enjoy the benefits of a nice air-conditioned, heated in the winter time. You know, we're seventh day from nine to 12 Adventists. We need to get up, folks, and we need to, we need to get down to business. So what does the Pope say about, about uh, the capitalist overlords? He's written much about it. He says, oh, the capitalists, they abuse their workers so much. They make them work every day of the week, even Sundays. The poor, overworked uh, laborers need their uh, corporate leaders or bosses to give them a day off. What day is that? Sunday. So that's where it's all moving to. So you need to sign up for the newsletter. That's going to be the next article. Now I want to make one final point. The title of these two presentations was The Final Test, Part 1 and Part 2. What is the final test all about? It's not merely an issue of days. It is an issue of authority. You see, if we keep the Sabbath, we are showing that we follow God's authority because he established the day. If we observe Sunday, we're accepting the authority of the little horn or the beast that claims to have established the day. So behind the test over the days is the issue of whose authority will I obey? That's the issue. Do you know that the Roman Catholic Church understood that? Let me just read you just a few statements here by Roman Catholic writers. This is John O'Brien, who for years was a theology teacher at the University of Notre Dame in South Bend, Indiana, near Andrews University. He wrote a book called The Faith of Millions, which was really a defense, an apologetic in favor of Roman Catholic theology. He wrote this, but since Saturday, not Sunday, is specified in the Bible, isn't it curious that non-Catholics who profess to take their religion directly from the Bible and not from the church observe Sunday instead of Saturday? Yes, of course it is inconsistent. But this change was made about 15 centuries before Protestantism was born. And by that time, the custom was universally observed. They, that is Protestants, have continued the custom, even though it rests upon the authority of the Catholic Church 
and not upon an explicit text of the Bible. And then notice this. That observance of Sunday remains as a reminder of the Mother Church from which the non-Catholic sects broke away, like a boy running away from home but still carrying in his pocket a picture of his mother or a lock of her hair. Protestantism was never able to totally sever its relationship with the Mother Church. That's why Protestants will return to the Mother Church. As he expresses it, they're still carrying in their pocket a picture of mother or a lock of her hair. Here's another one. It was the Catholic Church, which by the authority of Jesus Christ, which is not true, has transferred this rest to the Sunday in remembrance of the resurrection of our Lord. Thus the observance of, of, observance of Sunday brought Protestants is an homage they pay in spite of themselves to the authority of the Catholic Church. Are you, are you catching the picture? Here's another one. It was the Holy Catholic Church that changed the day of rest from Saturday to Sunday, the first day of the week. And it not only compelled all to keep Sunday, but urged all persons to labor on the seventh day under pain of anathema. Protestants who profess great reverence for the Bible, and yet by their solemn act of keeping Sunday, they acknowledge the power of the Catholic Church. The Bible says, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy, but the Catholic Church says, no, keep the first day of the week. And lo, the entire civilized world bows down in reverent obedience to the command of the Holy Catholic Church. Quite the statements, right? So it's an issue of authority. Whose authority will you obey? Will you obey the authority of God and reveal it by observing His sign, the Sabbath? Or will you accept the authority of the Roman Catholic Church and most Protestant churches and observe the first day of the week? That will be the final test. And the decisions that we are making today will determine on what side we are. You remember that we began these two presentations with a statement from Ellen White that it's the Sabbath that is going to unite the hearts of God's dear saints. Do you know why it's the Sabbath that's going to unite the hearts of God's dear saints? Because when the shaking over the issue of Sabbath and Sunday comes, Ellen White states that the majority of those who are in the Adventist church are going to leave. But the Adventist church is not going to suffer loss because many 11th hour workers are going to come into the church. And after they have embraced the Sabbath, God's people will be one, united in keeping the sign of God's authority. And then they will be ready to proclaim the loud cry and bring many others into the truth. We exist as a church for only one reason, to proclaim the three angels' messages. And if we're not doing that, we have no reason to exist. So we need to get down to business. We need to go out and share with others. Oh, but I don't know enough. Believe me, you know much more than the people that you're going to have contact with. Most of them are not even in left field. They're, they're not even the bleachers. They're out on the street. They don't have any idea about these important biblical subjects. So I pray to the Lord that as we've studied these things, that, that the Lord will bring them to our remembrance. Through the Holy Spirit, He will record them in our minds and in our hearts so that when we have an opportunity to share with others, that we will share boldly but lovingly with others about the great blessing in the Sabbath that God has given us, a day to unwind, to rest. Let me just end with an illustration. For those who think that the Sabbath is a burden, I went to school, I took my three years of theology in our university in Colombia. That's where I met my wife. We got married after my third year of college studying theology. 
And in the school at that time, this was in the, uh, in the 70s, actually 60s, late 60s, early 70s. At the school, it was segregated. Boys on one side and girls on the other. It was that way when I went to Wisconsin Academy too. Boys on one side and girls on the other. And so there was also a side of campus for the boys and another side of campus for the girls. And woe to the boy who crossed over the line, or vice versa. But anyway, for those who actually formalized their relationship in Jaime Mejia, he was there at the same time <laughs> that I was there. A lot of snow has fallen since then. <laughs> at least you have some. Mine is falling out. But there was what was called the cortina. Remember that? It's called the curtain. Those who formalized their relationship as boyfriend and girlfriend, every two weeks they could go to a teacher's house and spend a couple of hours together. Wow! That was really something. You know, I also taught there later on, so I participated in that uh, practice and I also had students come when I was a teacher. So I know what both sides of the fence are like. But anyway, you know, we could go for two hours and spend two whole hours forgetting studies and forgetting everything else, just spending time together. You know what? My wife and I always got there early. <laughs> See if we could steal three extra minutes. And at the end, we tried to stretch it. Like standing at the door and act like we were talking to the teachers and everything, but, you know, wanting to extend the time a little bit more. It wasn't the fact that, you know, when uh, that I was looking at my clock all the time and saying, well, sorry, dear, time's up. No way. The longer, the better. I have a pet peeve, the bulletin, putting the, the hour of the, of the sunset in the bulletin. Say, let's see now. The sun sets at 7 p.m. So at 6.59 we're saying, sun, go down quickly so I can have my popcorn. Or whatever you have on Saturday night. But Ellen White says we're supposed to guard the edges of the Sabbath. We're supposed to get there early because Jesus might come a little minute, a few minutes early and stick around a little bit afterwards. Do you think it was a real sacrifice for me to spend those two hours? When, when the time was coming, you say, oh, what a bummer. I just spent two whole hours from playing football and doing everything I'd like to do and have to spend two hours with her? No way! There was nothing else that I would want to do except for that. When I was a teacher, there was a, a, a girl and her boyfriend that came to our house on a regular basis. She came to me crying one day. She said, oh, Pastor, I'm so sad. I said, what's wrong? She says, it's my boyfriend. We were, supposed to, we were supposed to come to your house today to spend the two hours together. She says, but he said that he, that he wanted to go play a football. And she says, oh, she was sobbing. What should I do? I said, get rid of him. Because if football is more important than him spending two hours with you, there's something wrong with the relationship. Amen. That's what the Sabbath is all about. We just, oh, I, have to, I can't do this and I can't do that and I can't do the other. Man, how boring. No, if I love Jesus, it won't be boring. Changing pace and dedicating the whole day to my relationship with him. If I love him, I will keep his commandment. Amen. The Sabbath is not an obligation, it's a privilege. Amen. And the world needs to know it. This stressed out world needs to know it. And the only way they can know it is through us. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for your many blessings. We thank you for the Sabbath. Not a day of bondage, a day of slavery, but a day of joy, a day to spend the entire 24 hours with you, 
suspending everything ours and focusing only on everything yours. Lord, I ask that you will help us to keep the Sabbath holy, not because we have to, but because we love to spend the time with you. Also empower us to plant seeds in the minds of those who are searching for the truth, that they might experience the peace and joy of your Holy Sabbath. Thank you, Lord, for having been with us and for answering our prayer. For we ask it in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. Our topic tomorrow is the judge, the widow, and the adversary. You probably know we're going to study a parable that Jesus told. It's in Luke 18. Tremendous parable with great lessons for us in these last days. God bless you. Thank you for coming. Spread the word. Uh, tomorrow's Friday, so no reason to say, well, I got to get home early because early I got to go to work. So we can just bask in the Lord. God bless you all.